Welcome to the Telecom Exchange CEO Roundtables, both for our guests right here in the audience at TexLA, as well as our viewers joining us as we stream on Facebook on our JSA page and, and download on JSA TV. Our second panel today is IoT and the Data Center. We're talking cloud, power, and performance. We're honored to have my friend, Rich Miller. He is the founder and editor of Data Center Frontier. Rich is an unbelie unbelievable journalistic resource in our industry. I've known Rich since he was writing for CarrierHotels.com back in the day. And uh, he then founded Data Center Knowledge, of course, in 2005, which later sold in 2012 to iNet Interaction, part of Penton Media. Today, as the editor of Data Center Frontier, Rich does in-depth reporting and interviews the CEOs, managers, and data center professionals that are on the forefront of the data center industry and the cutting edge of cloud computing, which makes him, yep, a perfect moderator for our all-star panel today. So without further ado, please welcome Rich Miller. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, it has... Uh, uh, it's been great to, to see since I, I have known Jamie a while. It's been awesome to see the operation that she's built to help uh, uh, all of us here build business and uh, get educated uh, about the, the industry. So with that as our prelude, let's learn some things about the things. Our topic this morning is the Internet of Things, which is a broad subject encompassing all kinds of devices that now have brains and are connected to the internet uh, and are being applied in all kinds of different uh, uh, businesses and uh, services and applications. So uh, we have a, a really great panel here today to, to help us talk about this and understand what, uh, where the Internet of Things is taking us. Uh, Let's, uh, let's, uh, I'll start with brief in introductions and then uh, we'll get the conversation going. Uh, first, we have uh, Tony Lin, who is a director at GI Partners, uh, which has a long history of uh, work in the data center industry uh, locally. Most of you will be uh, aware of them for their ownership of One Wilshire. Uh, and then uh, next is Jonathan Martone, who is the director of data center engineering for CenturyLink. Uh, which has been in the news a little bit. You're n making news with your data centers there. Uh, next is Simon Lee, who's a director of Centeris and managing director of Sapiens Capital. Uh, and uh, he and his companies have been involved in many of the success stories in the internet infrastructure sector. Further down, we have Peter Gross, who uh, is the VP of Mission Critical Systems for Bloom Energy but uh, has been a pioneer in data center deni uh, design and uh, going way back to EYP and, and HP. And uh, Peter has always been, uh, had his sort of finger on the pulse of what's going on with data center design. Uh, and at the end, we have Rob Barlow, who is the CEO of Wire IE uh, and an entrepreneur who's, uh, whose companies have been major players in the Canadian telecommunications scene. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I thought I'd start off by just kind of getting a, a big picture view from each of you on the Internet of Things. Where, from your vantage point, are you seeing uh, the impact of the Internet of Things and what are some of the uh, uh, opportunities and challenges that, that you're seeing uh, rise from that? So, uh, Tony, get started. Oh, sure. Um so uh, I guess my answer to that would be on two levels, personal and professional. Um, I'll start with the drier side first. So professionally, um, yeah, I, 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 it's, it's, it's obviously a large opportunity for, for owner operators, well actually not operators, but owners like, like us. As, as you all know, um, GI has historically been involved in the data center operations business by investing in, in uh, a number of operators. Um, on our side, you know, we're landlords, and so we see this movement uh, uh, of the growth of the Internet of Things um, as, as something very bullish for 
uh, for our investments in, in, in our industry. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think, I think that's, a, that's a very big plus. And I think it, you're, you're really going to see a sea change in, in terms of the level of demand um, uh, uh, versus what it's been historically. Uh, so that's professional. That's the dry side. Here's the exciting side. Um, personally, though, right, um, I mean, I, I don't know about you all, but, I mean, how, how many of you have, like, like, a home security system? Anybody have that? Anybody have like one that's actually wireless and you can check it out on your phone? Do you have that? Right? That's so, so that's about like half the people in this room, right? So every one of those things relies on a sensor that goes through a hub that is connected to your home that will eventually connect to the cloud, right? Um, I've got 18 of those in my house. I'm just like sort of scratching the surface here. Um, and so I find, I find the growth of that side of the industry very, very exciting. I mean, just think about the number of homes, the number of devices. Um, uh, you know, we can talk about stats later, but it, just the, the growth that you actually see as a consumer um, is, is very, very, is very rapid um, and very broad. Uh, and so I think, I think the opportunity is there, and it's, it's, uh, it's very exciting. Jonathan, how about you? So I brought some statistics here with me. Uh, so as of 2015, 25 billion objects are connected to the Internet of Things. And that averages out, and this is just in, in uh, the, the, the states, 3.47 um, connected devices per, per person. In five years from now, it's going to double. 50 billion objects, 6.58 connected devices. So you know those, those devices include Nest thermostats, lighting, garage, door locks, appliances, cameras, security cameras. Um, the, the, the explosion of the Internet of Things is super exciting from a data center perspective because all of that stuff has to sit physically in a hardened facility, not only from a power and space standpoint, but also from a network perspective. So it's, it's driving connected data centers with multiple networks and also localization of that data. So it's, it's instead of kind of the, the, the old school you know, west, east, central kind of region, now it's getting down to uh, a distributed model where every single city is going to have some sort of data center connected to the Internet of Things. So, I mean, we're, we're in a we're in an industrial revolution right now. It's, it's a very exciting time. So maybe the thing to do uh, is to talk a little bit, maybe this way we can turn this into a chain conversation and I'll kind of pick up some of that. So um, what does that mean uh, going forward? Uh, it means that data centers do need to change. That's part of the topic of what we need to talk about. It means that your access networks are going to have to change, how you kind of groom local traffic at, you know, maybe a community level, at a plant level, whatever it is that you're putting devices on and sensors and trying to collect more data. Um, you know, in, in a community for cars. Uh, you know, some of you probably went to the event last night, and um, these cars are turning out. Uh, one Detroit manufacturer thinks about 25 gigs a day of data, and uh, so times that by the number of cars. And as these cars get smarter, what does that mean as well? So it is, um, it is an, an, an incredible opportunity, and all of these things. We're going to put sensors on everything that basically has, has, uses electricity. That at the end of the day, if you think about that, that's kind of what it is. I mean, lighting systems, your fridge, uh, your, um, your washer dryers, and things like that. And these are things that originally even came up as concepts when uh, energy was deregulated in 94, at least in the US. Um, the other thing that we should turn our attention to, which you know, Richard mentioned, are these challenges. Um, I'm going to throw one out there, which is the security issue. It's you know, one of the, the biggest issues everybody is aware of. You've got uh, people getting hacked, uh, Target getting hacked through a thermostat. How do you prevent that, right? These are every time you turn on a device, every time you deliver an IP, every time there's a piece of silicon and a radio inside a, a small board or an OBSD, you know, on a board device inside of a car, it's an opportunity for someone to to, to infiltrate. So these are things that um, you know we're going to get to, but are uh, uh, will slow down the growth or need to be solved in order for IoT to become truly the the promised land. Um, IoT is really not <coughs> not new. It's been around for a long time. Uh, what's new, it's the magnitude. Uh, um, I work for a company that manufactures fuel cells, and uh, we have several thousand sensors in a machine like these sending data continuously. So uh, just to give you a sense of the, the magnitude and what, what the challenges are, if we were to have only 100 sensors uh, in a year, we'll get 
approximately four petabytes of data. I mean, that's in itself is enormous. So, uh, when we're talking about uh, 2020, maybe 1.6 zettabytes. Zeta, zettabyte is, uh, for, I'm sure that you all know this, uh, zettabytes is 10 to the 2021. 20, uh, I, I like this uh, uh, statistic. Uh, if you're taking, if you were to take a one dollar bill, uh, you could you could connect between the Earth and the Sun, one uh, one one dollar bill on top of each other a million times, a million times. That's that's one zettabyte, and we're going to have 1.6 zettabytes in in 20 years. So the, uh, I'll I'll just list quickly the challenges because this is this is what uh, what we're facing today when it comes to. Uh, to the explosion of uh, Internet of Things network, you know, today, today's network are not adequate. Uh, uh, software defined, uh, defined network uh, uh, are the next step. Obviously, uh, the transition for 4G to 5G, 4G is really not uh, uh, not suited for uh, Internet of Things. We need uh, much faster, uh, <coughs> different software, uh, and uh, 5G, 5G will probably address that uh, the sensors how do we how do we have all these sensors that are able to uh, to survive for 10 years uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, consumptions uh, how how long does those batteries will last uh, uh, that's going to be uh, another big thing so latency uh, whether it's uh, uh, VR or, uh, or um, uh, IoT the latency is uh, very important, and that has a lot to do with uh, uh, transition from 4G to 5Gs. Uh, storage, I mean, storage is a big deal. Uh, uh, these drives are not getting uh, any more reliable; they're big, uh, solid st state. Um, it's uh, um, improved the, the latency very little. What's the answer? I don't know. Maybe optical discs. Uh, 300, uh, um, 300 gigabytes um, uh, might maybe uh, go to a thousand. Uh, that might be the solution. And finally, uh, you know, as you said, security is a big concern. Uh, um, uh, big data, uh, uh, the relationship between IT, uh, IoT and uh, big data, and obviously uh, the data centers. Uh, the data center is going to uh, see fundamental transition changes. Uh, uh, small unattended uh, um, distributed data centers, uh, um, totally different architecture. Uh, when you say unattended, uh, all of a sudden now we need to be concerned about uh, physical security. Um, there are, it's, it's a whole new world there and it's gonna be very exciting. Yes, um, so YRA is an or organization that's, uh, you know, our business is to implement Internet of Things <laughs> ecosystems. It's a multi-carrier discipline, multi-technology discipline. There's a lot of changes that have to go on. Um, it's, it's a different mindset. I mean, and it's happening quickly. Ericsson has predicted that in the next two years there's gonna be more Internet of Things devices out there connected than there are cell phones today. And two years from now, it's pretty fast. And if you look at some of the statistics around um, what 25 gigabytes means for, for a connected car, that's the same as 12 HD mo movies an hour. So there's a lot for us um, because we've I implemented these things. Um, we find that you know, the consum consumer side has its challenges, but we also have the industrial internet of things that has a lot of value. So we're really excited about that, but it's really, um, you know, requires discipline to manage multiple stakeholders. Um, you've got technology manufacturers who re really just want to put endpoints out there, and then you've got network operators who really have a network that they really don't want to upgrade, and then you have all the, you know, moves, ads, and changes, and how do we manage this data, and how do we report on it real time? So. The challenges are complex. It's very valuable, though. Right. Uh, the more data we have, the more valuable it is to our economies, to how we do business, and how we go around our day, day daily lives. So at YRE, we're really excited about it. It's we're on the edge. It's not it's not a key buzzword now. It's actually projects are being implemented, and uh, yeah, it's great. 
So there's a lot of business opportunities to, to talk about. But to kind of set that up, I wanted to pick up on something that uh, Peter mentioned and we heard discussed in the first panel of the morning where about virtual reality and how you take some of these very large files and, and workloads and distribute them with the, the kind of latency they require. So uh, how is the data center industry going to change in terms of where we build them and how we build them? Obviously, there's a real estate component uh, of this. Location uh, is always going to matter. Uh, and there, because there's capital investment, there's matching the, the sort of form factor to the, the business. So uh, uh, what do you guys see ahead in, in terms of uh, the, uh, the sort of edge piece of it and where we see uh, data centers being built and how do we get there? Simon, you want to kick off? You're, you're taking the um, Yeah, there's, well, there, we, we historically, um, actually some of like the companies that, you know, Tony, uh, Tony's firm has bought and managed were kind of the early data centers. They were carrier hotels. And, uh, you know, we went from there to uh, more purpose-built facilities for IT. Then people went, you know, super big, a little bit outside the city because it was cheaper and they needed the power. And um, within the last couple of years, the model of concentrating in the cities has come back um, a bit. Maybe somewhat smaller facilities, but certainly very metro-focused so that you could get to the access networks at the end, um, and get to the eyeballs. Um, this IoT move um, is probably going to push the data center further to the edge. Um, uh, we, we were trying to get, we spent a lot of years as uh, data center companies trying to get people to get out of their IT closets. Um, but the reality is, is that if you're running a plant, right, um, you probably need some sort of infrastructure on site in order to collect that data. And it will backhaul into, you know, something on a, at a metro level or a, on, a, on a larger level. But it is going to get pushed out to the edge. There's even been talk of um, your cell phone becoming a data center. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how that would work. But the <laughs> idea that it is a server is not too strange. And, um, and certainly, I think these other ideas of putting data centers inside of buildings and having that even as a service, if you're in a Class A office building, as an example. So I, I do think that you know, we've already gone as far out as we can, because we're already putting data centers in Iceland. Right? You can't go too much further than that. Eventually, I guess, maybe someone will try and do it on the moon. But the only thing we can do is, uh, is go the other direction, which is push it closer to the consumers. Um, or if it's an industrial application, you know, to an endpoint where the, the machines are. Tony, you're in the real estate uh, side of this. What, uh, what, what's your take on it? Well, well, you know, I, th I think it's interesting because he, the, the trend that, that Simon identified is actually not too different from some of the things that we're seeing in, in maybe some of the other real estate food groups. Um, many of which you experience in your daily lives. So, you know, wh what is this trend? This trend is, is uh, lower latency, get to the, to the end user what they want, when they want, meaning faster, right? Um, and so if, if you look at an analogy, one might actually look at industrial real estate, right? Um, and, and who currently is pushing the bounds of industrial real estate? It's, it's actually Amazon, right? Amazon, uh, and, and you know, I've spent a number of years in industrial real estate, so I can sort of uh, point this out to you. you know, the, 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 the supply chain uh, logistics sector has moved from you know, very large distributed warehouses to uh, smaller warehouses that are actually in metropolitan areas, meaning closer to the customer, so that um, you can click something on Amazon and get it same day, right? Uh, and so I think it's, it's fascinating that you know, you're talking about another sector of real estate where basically the same thing is happening. It's, it's just not merchandise that you're consuming. It's, it's bits and bytes, right? But, it, but it's a very similar phenomenon where you know, it's, it's, it's all about speed and latency and, and delivering things on time. So Peter, pick up on that. How, how do yeah, yeah, we Just, how are just to add to that, uh, uh, you know, we're talking about the edge data centers and uh, you know, there are many definitions of edge data center having to do with location, size, in terms of kilo, kilowatts or megawatts, whatever. But the, the ones, the definition which I like the best, and it goes beyond the internet of things, the uh, definition I like the best is <laughs> one that says that an edge data center is a um, data center that uh, supplies, provides at least 
80% of the content to at least 50% of the uh, broadband user in the area. So you, you think a small data center in Milwaukee, uh, how do you provide 80% of the content? Uh, and actually, the answer is fairly simple. Um, all you need to do is to have Netflix, Google, which is YouTube, and Akamai. Um, between the, the three of them, they account for 75% of the traffic. Uh, Netflix at night, it's over 40% of the traffic. I mean, the numbers are, are amazing. And then if you add uh, Amazon and uh, Apple and Microsoft and a few other, you go easily from 75 to 80%. Um, but, you know, there are many reasons for, uh, for the proliferation of uh, edge data centers. Um, you know, and these numbers are coming from uh, um, uh, Edge Connect uh, that says that uh, the ability to cache information at the edge data center as opposed to, uh, to bring it a thousand miles uh, uh, via backbone will save a company over five years over $100 million. $100 million saves in, in traffic fees over a backbone simply by, by caching the right kind of information at the, at the edge data center. So, Rob, maybe you could pick up on, you know, Peter's talked about some of the economics and what are the business opportunities that come out of that and uh, how do you try to approach those? Yeah, so when I hear edge da data centers, I'm obviously thinking of underserved markets too, right? right? So, and I'm thinking about uh, planning an, an industrial internet of things network, which is different than a consum consumer driven one, which has been basically like, you know, throwing your internet of things pepper shaker out there and then trying to do something with it. Um, so really it all comes down to, from the industrial internet of things, it comes down to really you know, having a different life cycle for planning and ar architecture around data. And then you look at the constraints that you have. So power is a big constraint. You're, and also, how, that is, how does that data actually being used uh, amongst the edge to deter deter determine what actually goes back on the typically unreliable pipe back to some metropolitan location? Um, so there's lots of... Um, opportunity in the industrial internet of things to kind of control and manage and provide um, the engineering discipline to actually build these things around data and um, solving problems um, that save a lot of money for mission critical uh, business applications. And then if you look at consumer, it's really about now I've got all these, as an example, wearables out there, and all of a sudden an earthquake right. happens, and now I can probably use that. But then there's up, then then you've got a reactionary um, design problem because now we've got privacy issues, we've got security now, that, like you know, when the whole security thing's even uh, bigger than we think because one device can be used as the platform to leapfrog a pro problem to many more. So it's exponential. So <clears throat> there's two there's two different things we got going on. We got one which is con consumer driven. You know, how do we kind of manage the data that's already out there? And then you have industrial internet uh, of things, which is how do we plan to make private networks secure and, and save money? So Jonathan, I'm interested in uh, your take on the same question. CenturyLink obviously has a lot of enterprises it works with, what, what are the opportunities that you see here to build products and services around Internet of Things? So from a business perspective, uh, the, the IoT brings a ton of opportunities. You know, we've seen kind of a deregulation from, you know, Equinix kind of had the, the monopoly on peering, and because of IoT, now you have CoreSight, and you have DLR, you have One Wilshire, you have CenturyLink, you have Cyrus One, so you have this distributed model that's pushing the content closer to the customers from, a, from an eyeball perspective. And then you're also shortening geography because there's no way to, you know, there's no way to uh, improve latency without shortening geography. So that's, that's another nice feature set. Um, these data centers are getting pushed closer to the consumers. Uh, the carriers are providing big, big circuits, 100 gig circuits, uh, CenturyLink network just tested successfully two and a half terabits yesterday with Infinera. So the network providers are, are keeping 
up with the uh, with the increase of consumption from a from a bandwidth perspective. So this is this is this is just revolutionary. Um, it, it, it's nice to see kind of uh, as opposed to competition. It's I, I view it as a coopetition where everybody's kind of working together to serve uh, business and residential customers um, jointly. So <clears throat> one of the questions is the the pace of adoption. And we have sort of some uh, applications for this uh, emerging now. We look at the, the home security systems that, that Tony talks about. Um, when, uh, what do you, what's each of you, uh, I'm curious about your take on uh, when we'll see Internet of Things start to really move along to the point where it's uh, changing the way that, that uh, the, the data center industry uh, kind of works with them. What's the what's the the rollout look like, Tony? Oh well, um, yeah, I, I I would say it's changing things right now. Yeah. So it, you know, it's it's not what, a matter of when; it's just really now and how much. Um, I think off of that same Ericsson survey that you and I probably tried to study furiously, you know, <laughs> the last few minutes before this panel. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, there was a there was a a, a Kager rate that was cited as something like twenty three percent growth over the next six or seven years in IOT. Um, and so, I, I mean, if you just think about that, that's just staggering, the, the amount of traffic um, that needs to be moved, right? Um, and that's, I, frankly, I think, all right, what, what is that based on? Is that just based on a linear projection or is that actually based on exponential? Um, because if you think about home security systems and cars and your wired, you know, your wireless fridge and all these other things, big data and all that, um, you know, you could certainly see a scenario where the growth could be much, much larger than, than even some people are forecasting. So what does that mean? That means um, uh, more space will be needed, right? Or better technology will be needed to actually house that, you know, house the, those bits and bytes that are moving through that same building. Jonathan, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, definitely more, more data centers, um, more network providers, um, more cloud providers that are living in data centers. I think there's a misnomer that clouds kind of taken over co-location and data centers, but the cloud lives in the data center. So, um, you know, I think that you're going to see CSPs, cloud service providers, push um, their content closer to the uh, to the local data center. So, I think there's going to be a lot of more cooper cooperation between data center operators, network service providers, and cloud service providers to um, really satisfy the needs of business and residential customers in, in all the different industries, medical, government, et cetera. So uh, I, we, again, we're, I, mean, I can't emphasize this, we're in, we're in an exciting time from a data center standpoint and a, and a network perspective. Um, you know, the, the connected data center, the dark fiber options in data centers are, 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 are pivotal. Um, so we've got a few minutes left. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, it's a great panel. Uh, thank you, Ronald Greer from Frost and Sullivan. So my, my uh, question, well, I, I know that uh, uh, that Ericsson uh, numbers, they got reviewed uh, downwards, right? Uh, I know uh, Cisco has not changed their numbers yet, but uh, my, uh, I just, I, every time I think about the Internet of Things, I look at, you know, all, all the different areas and how, uh, you know, you have to bring in these different vertical stacks and many of those folks are not talking, like let's say, uh, you know, and, and you, you wanna address some overarching issue and come up with a spec or a standard. So I, I wanna hear from each one of you, where do you think could be a starting point where we may actually drive convergence between, like let's say an IoT solution for a building, right? Where you have uh, Johnson's Controls, et cetera, and Cisco and all these companies, they don't normally talk to each other. Who could spearhead this? Would this be an IEEE thing? an IETF thing, uh, or it could be some other organization that we hear all these standards uh, groups like Zigbee, whatever. Who, who do you think will drive this? So for the folks on the internet, the question is about standards and where they come from and how they develop. Who'd like to tackle that? Rob. I could do the first uh, response. So um, there is a big issue without standards, um, and Internet of Things has that issue. Um, the edge devices, I don't think there is a standard. We've got multiple manufacturers building uh, technology and uh, 
they all have different ideas of how, how those are going to end. Like, you know, we've seen it. We've heard, heard, heard about it, you know, hard coding passwords, stuff like that. That's a standards issue. But if I look at uh, the network operator, which is MySpace, um, there's a great standards body called the Metro Ethernet Forum. And uh, a lot of these, um, you know, technologies and big data flow over Ethernet uh, technology. So the e Metro Ethernet Forum um, has standards. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, software del delivery fr frameworks and network uh, virtualization standards. So I, I would say that's, you always have to go where someone puts up their hand first, and I'd say uh, the Metro Ethernet Forum is the, probably the way to go for now for us. Um, so just, I mean, a couple of things. IEEE will need to be involved, uh, no doubt, and eventually some of these standards will actually become standards. Right now, they're, um, uh, people are proposing different things. But um, just on the communication side, uh, as a follow-up, like uh, LoRa, uh, the lower alliance, I think, is pretty important. Um, the reason is, you know, a lot of the th a lot of IoT is going to be wireless, and um, is it all going to run over the cell network? We've heard that 4G may not be right, and guess what? There's people are you know watching Netflix on 4G, so th there are a lot of competing applications. So, um, one of the things that Lora will do is it'll give uh, IoT its own channel. Doesn't isn't doesn't that sound like a good idea? All right, so that all of a sudden there's another piece of spectrum open, so that. Um, all the machines can talk on the same uh, set of frequencies and uh, maybe the failover is LTE or something like that or Ethernet or something, something else. But I think those things, getting traction is incredibly important and the likes of Cisco and others you know, will need to play ball as well. Yeah, on the private, on the private sector, I don't know if you heard, there's a company called Litbit. They are building a platform that uh, will enable various uh, network devices uh, to talk to each other in an encrypted form. Um, it's, a, it's a startup, it's a fairly new. The, uh, the main focus right now is data center where there are multiple platforms, uh, uh, on the, uh, both on the power and cooling side, but um, the intent is to expand into buildings and uh, uh, further down. But, uh, but that's one of, uh, one of the av uh, avenues. Anything else? Well, the one thing that we, did someone else want to? Could you repeat the name of that startup? Litbit. Litbit, L-I-T-B-I-T. Uh, Scott Noteboom, who used to run data centers for you know, Yahoo and worked at Apple, has, has put that together. Uh, and they're trying to build a platform that can help tie Internet of Things together. You can read about it on Data Center Frontier. Uh, <laughs> at this point, the, the one thing we never want to do is be standing between the, the people in lunch so at this point, I'd like uh, to thank our panel for uh, an engaging conversation. And please feel, feel free to come up and uh, talk to them and learn more about uh, their business.